invite to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 is where we're going to be this morning. Back in 2007, there was a pastor named Jose Luis de Jesus Miranda. It's a long title. He was pastor of Growing in Grace Church in Miami, Florida, and he made headlines. Here's why he made headlines. He claimed to be Jesus Christ himself in the flesh. He brainwashed his church members to get tattoos of 666 because he also believed that he was the Antichrist at the same time. He was the Christ and the Antichrist. And... His birthday is on April 22nd, so his church members celebrate the true Christmas on April 22nd, his birthday. Well, he died back in 2013, and after his death, his followers gave him a new name. He's no longer called Jesus in the flesh. He's now called Melchizedek, the great high priest. Many people over the centuries have claimed to be Jesus the Messiah in the flesh. You can go back way far into history. Back in the 1830s in England, there was a rebel against the crown. His name was John Nicholas Thorne. He claimed to be the savior of the world and the reincarnation of Jesus. Some of you may remember back in the 70s and 80s, the Moonies. They would stand on the side of the road with the flowers. Sun Myung Moon, the founder of the Moonies, the Unification Church, he claimed to be the Messiah the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He also believed that he and his wife were the reincarnation of Adam and Eve. Some of you may remember the incident that happened in Waco, Texas, back in 1993, when the FBI raided the Branch Davidian compound. The leader of that cult was David Koresh, and David Koresh claimed to be God's final prophet on earth. He called himself the Son of God, the Lamb of God, David Koresh. You may not know about this guy. There's a preacher in Australia. His name's A.J. Miller. He travels all around Australia and New Zealand. He's got this ministry called Divine Truth. He claims to be Jesus Christ reincarnated. And get this, his girlfriend thinks that she's Mary Magdalene reincarnated. So they go around as Jesus and Mary Magdalene giving these seminars. Back in 2007, a former British MI5 agent, David Shaler, proclaimed himself to be the Messiah and released a bunch of YouTube videos claiming to be Jesus. There is no shortage of people throughout history who have been deluded to think that they are, in fact, Jesus Christ in the flesh, Jesus Christ reincarnated. They've come to usher in the end of the world. Now, what in the world does this have to do with anything that the Bible talks about? We come to the final speech that Jesus gives publicly, publicly, before his crucifixion. And he's going to prophesy about the events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem that happened in A.D. 70. Now, we're going to eventually get to the end times here in, just a, in, just, in next week, but the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 is a prototype. It's a harbinger of what the final thing will look like when Jesus comes back on that last day. Now, I know it's been a long, long time that we started the Gospel of Luke, but, and you probably don't remember that first sermon because I don't remember that first sermon that I preached but most scholars agree that Luke was written after A.D. 70. Most scholars believe it was probably written in the late 70s or the early 80s, the original early 70s and late, late 70s, early 80s. And it's important to know the date of the book of Luke because Jesus is prophesying what's going to happen in A.D. 70, but his, Luke's original audience would have looked back upon this and already known that it had happened that it was already destroyed. And so, Jesus addresses two sections in this issue, in in, in this section of Luke. So there's two issues he's going to address. The destruction of Jerusalem that happened in A.D. 70, and then his second coming. Now, you remember last week when I came up here and my iPad didn't have my sermon and I got all freaked out and I couldn't see, and so I had to, I brought my glasses and I've got my reading glasses, but um, 
I talked to Crystal last week. Crystal works for an eye doctor. I said, what can I do? And so she said, well, you can get transition glasses or you can get bifocals. And so I'm going to give you kind of a bifocal analogy here. Jesus is giving us a bifocal analogy. Okay, so with bifocals, when you, when you wear bifocals, you look down at the, at the immediate like what's right in front of you? And my problem was, if I wore just reading glasses, I could see to read, but when I look up, you're all fuzzy. So bifocals help me when I look up, I can see you out on the horizon. Okay. So what Jesus does here is something like bifocals. To the, to the, to the immediate, it's the destruction of, Israel, of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. That's the immediate context that happened historically. But then the long range, looking out into the audience, into the horizon, is his second coming. So you're going to have to wait till next week to get to what Jesus teaches about the second coming. There's too much information in this passage of Scripture for us to focus it in all on one Sunday. So we're going to explore the destruction of A.D. 70 and what Jesus talks about leading up to that. Now, you can get caught up in all of the intricacies of the end times that you can lose the forest for the trees. You can get into prophecy conferences and and look at YouTube clips and you can go to podcasts or the latest and greatest books and you can look at the signs of the times and you can get out your, your newspaper and try to figure out, are we in the end times? People ask me all the time, Pastor Sean, are we living in the end times? And I say, yes, we are. You know when the end times started? When Jesus ascended back up into heaven. You know when the end times are going to end? When Jesus comes back. We're one day closer than we were yesterday. So we're living in the end times, and I think it's exciting where people want to learn all the the signs of the times. But what I want us to look at today, and this is something that the book of Revelation, I've studied the book of Revelation a lot, and and there's, there's two issues in the book of Revelation, there's two issues in this passage of Scripture that we need to understand as a church family. This is what Jesus and the book of Revelation tell us about where we're living right now. There are two dangerous threats that the church in all ages are going to face, but especially us today. What are these dangerous threats that we face as a church? Here's the first. First, we will always be attacked from inside through false teaching. There's going to come attacks inside the church through false teachers, people claiming to know the Scriptures and and twisting it. There'll be inside attacks. That's one dangerous threat. The second dangerous threat is we will always be attacked from outside the church through persecution. So we have a double whammy. There's always, going to be pers- there's always going to be false teaching from within, and there's always going to be persecution from without, bringing pressure upon believers. And so Jesus addresses both of these issues this morning in this passage of Scripture. And so what I want us to do is I want us to read this, and it kind of divides up into three parts, but I want us to pay attention to the commands that Jesus gives. He gives us some commands. How are we to respond? How are we to act? What are we to do in light of living in these end times? So let's read together. If you've got your Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 21, or you can swipe there, or you can click there, or however you get to it. Starting in verse 5. While some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, The days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time's at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not be at once. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilence, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you'll be brought before the kings and governors for my namesake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You 
will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. So let's explore these three aspects or these three sections here that Jesus gives us. And the first one we see is in verses 5 and 6. We see the context and the national symbol of Israel, the temple. Okay, the context. Where's Jesus preaching? Now, remember what's happened. On the triumphal entry, what we call Palm Sunday, Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a colt, and then on Monday, he cleansed the temple. And he continues to be in the temple, teaching publicly in the temple. So that's where he's at. He's in the temple, but at that time that Jesus is at the temple, the temple is, is a place of grandeur. It's, it's a wonderfully, immensely opulent place. Precious stones, gold, some of the marble foundation of the stones were 40 feet long and weighed more than a hundred tons. We find out from John chapter 2 that by the time Jesus is on the scene, the temple has been under construction for 50 years. It rose 60 feet above Mount Zion. The, these massive gold plates, here's what would often happen. These plates, these gold plates that were on the temple, when the sun would hit them just the right way, it would be blinding. It would blind you. As a matter of fact, people from a distance as they were coming to look at the temple, because of the gold, it almost looked like snow-capped mountains. It, it, it was so blazingly bright because the sun would shine upon it. And as we're going to see next week, this temple is overthrown. General Titus of the Roman army comes in and ransacks and tears down the temple. Now this would have shocked the original hearers because notice what Jesus says about this opulent, glorious temple. In verse 6 he says, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus looks at this glorious, huge temple and says, This place is coming down. It's going to be destroyed, which leads to a question, a good question that the disciples ask. What do the disciples ask Jesus? Well, in verses 7 through 11, this is the second section, the disciples ask a question about signs, the signs related to the destruction of the temple. Notice in verse 7, they asked him, teacher, when, okay, when will these things be? Okay, we know historically it happened in A.D. 70. These things, the destruction of the temple, and what will be the signs when these things are about to take place? Before the destruction of Jerusalem, Jesus says there's going to be some signs that are going to happen. Now notice the first thing that Jesus says there. Verse 8, see that you're not led astray, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Interestingly, in the original language, how Jesus words this, and, and you're going to know this when I tell you this, when Jesus says many will come saying, I am he, literally, many will come in my name saying, I am. There's, that's not a mistake that they would say, I am. Basically, they're taking the place of God. Where else have we seen that statement, I am? Back at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So these false Christs are going to be coming in the name of Jesus saying, I am the Messiah. I am the prophet. I, I am the Lord. They're going to pervert his teachings. Now, we know from history, leading up to A.D. 70, that there were false messiahs. We actually find out in the Bible there was one. In Acts chapter 5, verse 36. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him, 
he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. Now, the Bible says Theodos claimed to be somebody. He claimed to be somebody. Well, you go back and you read Josephus. Okay, so Flavius Josephus is the great Jewish historian. He wrote about the history of the Jewish people during the time of Jesus. He gives us more information about this Theodos. Who is this guy? He said around AD 46, Theodos, this is what Josephus writes about him. He was a charlatan who convinced people he was a prophet or the Messiah. They would come and overtake Rome. He persuaded these people to give up all their belongings and follow him across the Jordan River. He thought he could command the river to divide and stand still like Joshua in the Old Testament. So he's a false teacher coming on the scene even within that historical context. But here's the point. Even today, we must be on guard against false teachers. Attacks that come from inside the church. One commentator said this, I like what he says, the greatest threats to believers are not external dangers, cataclysmic though they are, but dangers inside the household of faith. Notice what Jesus says there. In verse 7, when they ask about the signs, Jesus says in verse 8, see that you are not led astray. Literally, don't wander off the path. Don't be led astray by false teachers. And we see this all throughout the Scriptures, this warning against false teachers. Acts chapter 20, Paul is gathering the Ephesian elders together to give them a farewell address, and, and Paul addresses this issue to the leaders of the church. He says in Acts 20, 29-31, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish you with tears. Did you catch what Paul said to the elders? From among your own number will arise men speaking twisted things. Be alert. Don't be led astray by false teaching. Don't be deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13 Paul says, While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. There's always going to be deceiving people out there. They're going to want to deceive you with false doctrine, false teachings, twisted and perverted things. 2 Peter 2, 1-3, through 3, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Twisted words to lead people astray. Now 1 John 2.18 might be a little confusing when I read this to you, but let me just explain it. John says, children, it's the last hour, and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it's the last hour. Now, what does it mean? Many Antichrists have come. So, literally, there's going to be an end-time world Antichrist. Revelation refers to him as the beast from the sea. There will be a literal man, I believe, who's literally the end times antichrist. But John says that there are many antichrists that have come up. And so what's an antichrist? It's basically a person that speaks either against Christ. The word anti in Greek can mean against or in the place of. A person speaks against Christ or a person thinks they are in the place of Christ. They're a false teacher. They even think that they're Jesus himself. And then 2 John 7, when was the last time you read something from 2 John? For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. So Jesus says, do not be deceived. Don't be led astray. Don't wander off the path. These people are going to come. They're going to come in my name. They're going to come with false teaching. They're going to come. Don't 
be deceived. And then Jesus also says, notice what he says there. At the end of verse 8, do not go after them. No longer, don't, don't, don't just be deceived or led astray, but don't go after them. You know what that word is? I looked up that word, do not go after them in the original language. It means don't follow them like sheep. Don't blindly follow false teachers. Don't get so mesmerized or excited by their personality or their smooth words that you lack all discernment and you follow them like blind sheep. The other place that word is used to follow or go out after them is where Jesus describes the sheep in John 10 verse 4. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. They go before him. They follow him. So Jesus says, don't be led astray. Don't follow them. Don't give in to false teaching. So let me just ask you a question. How do you practically not be led astray by false teaching? How do you practically not be mesmerized into false teaching? Well, the answer is very simple. It requires a lot of time and energy. The answer is simply to saturate yourself with the truth. Saturate yourself with the scriptures. Be so informed of the, the Bible that when the counterfeit comes along, you're able to see it for what it is. You need to have your mind transformed. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do you renew your mind? You renew your mind by reading your Bible and spending time in your word, searching the scriptures, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures. And then Paul says in Colossians three sixteen, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let, let this Bible live in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So be discerning in who you listen to. Be discerning in what you watch. And if something comes across your internet or across your email or across YouTube, always just have a check in your spirit and say, you know, is this accurate? Always filter everything through the Scriptures. So Jesus first says, hey, listen, this temple's coming down. As great and grand as it is, it's coming down. And the disciple says, well, when is this going to happen? And Jesus addresses the first threat. The first threat to the church is always from inside. False teaching. False teachers, an internal threat to twist the scriptures, to twist the gospel, to lead people astray from the truth. So what's the second threat? Well, the second threat is external pressure. Pressure from outside that comes through persecution. So we see this in verses 10 through 11. We see wars and natural disasters preceding the destruction of Jerusalem. So notice what Jesus says there. There will be great earthquakes, verse, verse 11, in various places, famine, pestilence. There will be terrors, great signs from heaven. So there's going to be all these things happening before the fall of Jerusalem. And it's interesting, if you go back in history, you find out these things came true. In A.D. 66, just four years before this, there's a huge war that broke out. The zealots, these Jewish leaders, tried to overthrow the Roman Empire and it caused a war. The historical record shows that between A.D. 60 and A.D. 80 in the Roman Empire, and especially around that area in Israel, there were great famines, there was pestilence, there were powerful earthquakes. There were two powerful earthquakes. There was a powerful earthquake in Phrygia in A.D. 61 and then Pompeii in A.D. 63. Now, that's not the big one. Remember Pompeii? The, the big one was in A.D. 79, but they had a precursor to that in A.D. 63. So all of these natural disasters, and Ezekiel 38, 19 says this, For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath I declare, on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. There's going to be an earthquake. And also, notice what, notice what it says there, too. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Great signs from heaven. Now, again, this is talking about what happens before the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Josephus, again, recorded this very interesting stuff. He said that there were stars 
in the shape of a sword hovering over Jerusalem. Unusual comets were seen at that time. Temple gates opening up on their own accord. Here's a weird one that he said that happened. I don't know exactly how to take this one, but he said that, um, and some of you farmers would think this is very weird, cows gave birth to sheep. Okay, some weird things happening. Now, these are harbingers of what happened before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. These are pictures of what's going to happen before the final end. So here's what I believe is going to happen. Right before Jesus comes back, there will be an escalation of these things worldwide. There will be an escalation of earthquakes. There will be an escalation of wars. There will be an escala- There's going to be a worldwide escalation of these things. Now, for how long, I don't know. But the Bible does say that these things came before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and these things will come before the end, the end, end, before Christ returns. So there are two primary commands to sum up this section. What does Jesus say at the very end there? He says, don't be deceived. And then he said, don't be afraid. Verse 9, don't be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end will will not be at once. So don't be deceived and don't be afraid. We live in a wacky world. We live in a crazy world. And I can just tell you right now as pastor, you live in a world where there's a lot of deception and a lot of reasons to fear. And Jesus is saying, don't be deceived and don't be afraid. I think sometimes when you look at the signs of the times and you look at all the things that are going on in our world, <clears throat> there's a temptation to get afraid. I'm fearful. What's going to happen? And we need to remember that God is in control. Verses 12 through 19. Jesus explains how persecution will occur before the destruction of Jerusalem. This is the external pressure. We need to be on guard against internal false teaching. We also need to be on guard against external persecution. And then notice what he says there in verse 12. What's going to happen? Before all this, and what's the this in the context here in Luke, he's talking about the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Before all this, they will lay their hands on you, persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Now, we saw that happen, right, in the book of Acts. Just read the whole book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, 4 and 5. Peter and John are arrested for proclaiming the name of Christ. They're beaten. Acts chapter 7. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, dies, stoned to death. Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa kills James, the brother of John, with a sword. In the second half of Acts, Paul is appearing before the the governing authorities. He's before Gallio, he's before Felix, he's before Festus, he's before Agrippa. So all of these things are happening. But notice that Jesus says, (coughs) excuse me, these imprisonments will take place at at the end of verse 12 for my name's sake. It's going to happen because you claim the name of Jesus. Luke 6.22 Blessed are you when people hate you and they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. 1 Peter 4.14 If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the Spirit of glory and God rests upon you. And then notice what Jesus says. This gives us an opportunity to do what? Verse 13, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. Now, let me tell you what the word witness is in the original language. You may not like this. <coughs> Excuse me. It's where we get the word martyr. It's got a double meaning. You're a martyr when you bear witness to Jesus, just the Greek word, but in our culture, you're a martyr when you die for bearing witness for Jesus. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you die for your faith, but it's where we get the word martyr. It means to bear witness. But notice what Jesus says about that. He says in verse 14, Settle it, therefore, in your minds. 
In other words, he's saying, listen, you need to be fully convinced beforehand. You need to have a strong predetermination beforehand that you're going to trust in Jesus to give you words. And Jesus says, literally in the, in the text there, I myself will give you the words to say at your time of testing. When you're brought before authorities and you really don't know what to say, I myself, Jesus says, in that hour will give you words. Now, Mark's gospel says it a little bit differently. Here in Luke, Jesus says, I myself will give you words. In Mark 13, 11, when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So whether it's Jesus himself or the Holy Spirit, I don't care. I want both in that time. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to give us boldness. And that's what Paul prayed for. Ephesians 6, 19-20, pray for me, Paul says. Well, how can we pray for you, Paul? That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We need boldness in those times. Pastor Andrew read this earlier in our time of confession, 1 Peter 3, 15. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I want you to understand two things about the word witness. When Jesus says this gives you an opportunity to bear witness, okay, two things about the witness. You give testimony through your words and you are a testimony through your action and your lifestyle you give a witness and you are a witness now here's the thing you may never give a verbal witness but people watch you and you are a witness whether you know it or not whether you like it or not how you live your life is a witness it's either a negative witness or a positive witness and then you give witness verbally. So you give a witness and you are a witness. We need to rely upon the Holy Spirit to give us words. You know, I think the Lord answered Paul's prayer. Because at the end of the book of Acts, when he's under house arrest and he's, he's there, listen to how the book, this is how the book of Acts ends. Acts 28, 30 through 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and look at this, with all boldness and without hindrance. That's my prayer for our church. That amid whatever comes our way, whether it's persecution, whether it's hostility, whether it's name-calling, we would proclaim the kingdom of God and teach about Jesus Christ with all boldness, and we would be unhindered in that. That we would be bold in our witness. That we would not be hindered. But then verse 16 is something that's kind of unsettling, a little scary. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You'd think the family would be the safest place for you to share your faith and live out your Christianity. Family members are going to turn family members in. Now this happened. Roman persecution under Nero in A.D. 64 there are reports that a lot of family members turned in their Christian friends and family members, and they were burned on those stakes that Nero used to light his gardens. And then I love the encouraging words that Jesus gives in verse 17. Aren't you encouraged by this? You will be hated by all people for my name's sake. Thanks, Jesus. Appreciate it. You'll be hated by everybody for being a Christian, for his name's sake. For devotion to Christ, for holding fast to the gospel. Jesus said this in John 15, 18 through 19. If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, before we get depressed and discouraged, Jesus gives two final teachings two final issues in verses 18 and 19. And I want to explain this because it shows two, two sides of the same coin. God's absolute sovereignty and human responsibility. This is called compatibilism. 
God's absolute meticulous sovereignty is compatible with human freedom. Don't ask me how it works, but you see it right here. Okay, so let's look at God's absolute sovereignty. What do you see there in verse 18? But not a hair of your head will perish. Now, does that mean that you're not going to die? No, because he said some of you are going to be taken to the slaughter. Some of you are going to be killed. What's Jesus saying here? He's saying that God is absolutely sovereign over your soul. They may take your body. They may persecute you, but the one thing they can't take is your salvation because God has sovereignly kept you in his grip. Luke addressed this earlier. In Luke 12, verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after have nothing more they can do, but I'll warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he's killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Don't fear those that can kill you or persecute you or malign you. Why? Because he's got the hairs on your head numbered. He's got you sovereignly in his grip. This was read to open up the worship service in John 10, 28 and 29. I give them eternal life. This is Jesus speaking. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. We're in the double grip of the Father and the Son. No one can snatch us out. Now, they may come against us with persecution. They may come against us with name-calling. They may come against us with all types of, of, of pressure. But the one thing they can't do is they can't pluck us out of God's grip. We are eternally secure in the power of our Savior. Romans eight twenty eight. we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Okay, so there's the, there's the God's sovereignty. He's got you in his grip. He's got you in his clutch. He's sovereign over your life. He's got every hair on your head numbered. Okay, what's the human responsibility piece? Okay, look at verse 19. By your endurance, you will gain your life. So let me put it this way, in a sentence. Because God is sovereign, we must endure to the end. We have a responsibility to endure, to remain steadfast, to not be led astray, to not fold. Isaiah 7, 9 says, if you are not firm in faith, you'll not be firm at all. To be firm in your faith. Now notice he says there, by your endurance, you'll gain your lives. That word lives literally can mean soul. You'll gain your soul. Luke 9, 23 through 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We, we are called to endure. We're called to remain steadfast. Matthew 10, 22, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Revelation 2, 3, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you've not grown weary. Now let me show you a passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 13 that teaches these two truths. God's absolute predestinating sovereignty over your life, and then your responsibility to endure. Right there in the same passage. It's in context of taking the mark of the beast. Okay, Revelation 13, 8 through 10. All who dwell on the earth, that's, that's unbelievers, will worship it. That's the beast. Antichrist. Okay? Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone's to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here's a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Now, no matter how you understand the book of Revelation, let me just tell you that there's a lot of ways to understand this, but there's two things in this passage of Scripture. Number one, if you are a child of God, God has sovereignly written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. You've been eternally predestined by God's sovereign decree. But number two, you've got to endure to the end. Because God has taken care of you, because God has predestined you, because God has sovereignly got you in his grip, you and I are called to endure. But here's the, here's the beautiful thing about it. God ensures that you will. You don't do it in your own power. God gives you the grace to endure to the end. He gives you saving grace at your salvation, and He gives you sustaining grace all the way to the end. 
God is responsible for what God is for, responsible for. Okay, what is God responsible for? Keeping you saved. God is responsible for keeping you saved, for choosing you, for loving you, for, for keeping you. That's God's responsibility. What are you responsible for? Not being led astray. Enduring patiently. Being faithful. And you and I don't have the power to do this on our own. Only God can do it. So let me give you some encouraging verses that teach us that God's going to do it in you. You and I have to endure. You and I ha- we, don't, we don't want to be led astray. We don't want to go after these false teachings. We, we want to remain faithful. Okay, I can't do it in my own power. Let me give you some verses to teach that God will do it in you. So 1 Corinthians 1, 7-9. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God will sustain you to the end because He's faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful he will surely do it god is faithful to make sure you make it to the end not in your own power he's going to make sure you make it to the end so yes you have to endure to the end yes you have to remain steadfast but you don't do it in your own power god makes sure it happens in you he's going to get you to the end jude now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So you're going to face opposition through two, two areas. Okay? We're always going to deal with this. Until Jesus comes back, we are, as, if, you, if you claim the name of Christ and we're faithful to Christ, even individually or as a church, you, I can guarantee you're going to face these two things. Number one, there's always going to be pressure from within, within to, to embrace false teaching. There's always going to be false teachers, false theology, trying to destroy the church from inside. Yet at the same time, there's always going to be threats from the outside. The culture, the government, pressure, they're going to persecute you. They're going to come against you. And so as we live in this reality until Jesus comes back, we don't want to be deceived. We want to remain faithful. And here's the blessing is that he will give us the power to be able to do it. Listen to the words of Romans 8, 38-39. I am sure that neither death nor life Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would we claim that promise as we move forward? Facing persecution, facing false teaching, nothing can take us out of the sovereign grip of our great Savior. So let me ask you to bow your heads this morning and let's go into a time of prayer and just spend some time reflecting, thinking, meditating. There's a lot in this passage of Scripture I know that's probably going through your mind, but just spend these few seconds together in silent prayer before your Lord and then, and then we'll, we'll close. Lord, we need your help because we live in a crazy culture. Lord, we live in a time where there are so many false teachings and weird philosophies and just things trying to lead us astray. And Lord, at the same time, we live in a culture that does not like the gospel, that does not like biblical principles. And so, Lord, we are getting pressure from culture to to be silent. So, Lord, how do we navigate this? So we need your grace to not be deceived. We need your grace to not be afraid. We need your grace to be able to speak truth and be a testimony. And we need your grace to endure. And Lord, I'm thankful for these promises that says you're faithful to do it. When we feel weak, when we feel like we can't, when we struggle, Lord, help us just to cry out to you and we can receive that grace and that refreshing and that power that we need. 
So, oh, Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. We need your power. We need your influence. We need your grace. We can't live this Christian life in our own flesh. Lord, we can't live it alone. Lord, help us to see there's safety in numbers as a church family, that we're, we're in this together. We're not isolated individuals trying to fight this battle ourselves, but, Lord, we're together. So, Lord, as we leave this place, give us strength. Give us courage. Help us to face whatever comes our way by your power alone. Thank you, Jesus, for being our king. And it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen.